so this is the brief. It reads, as a growing ecclesia, we must learn to get along together. This series is to encourage each other to that end, focusing on how the ecclesia should function as a body, and our brethren and sisters in far off places, what it means to share fellowship, and finally the importance of meeting together regularly. Well, I couldn't help but smile when I reread this brief. You see, when we were on the cusp of officially becoming members of rugby, I vividly remember Brother Robin Baston's exhortation at the very start of the year about the challenges that are presented by a growing ecclesia. And there we were, Sister Hannah and I, uh, sat, uh, about to be the two most recent members of the ecclesia, members 98 and 99, if I'm not very much mistaken. Uh, and now it's me that's being given this subject about uh, the challenges presented to a growing ecclesia. Maybe I'm part of the problem. This is where the, the subject comes from, this idea of many members that occurs in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to see what we can learn from 1 Corinthians 12 this evening to help us on our way. Now we're going to spend a little time in 1 Corinthians 12, but before we begin, I think it's helpful to establish a frame of reference for what I'm going to be looking at with you this evening. Now we might consider that 1 Corinthians was a letter written by Paul to a first century group of believers who were struggling with problems of their day. And because we live in very different times to them, uh, and with very different blessings and challenges, we might think that the letter has limited relevance to us, particularly as we have been given things such as the spirit gifts. But another quite different perspective sees this not simply as a letter written by Paul, but as a letter written by God through Paul to a group of believers whose challenges are representative of challenges that will need to be overcome by them and many other followers of Jesus before his return. This is the perspective that I'll be taking uh, this evening. I therefore suggest that the so-called first letter of the Corinthians reaches far beyond the historical context of Paul's day. Not that I'm suggesting the historical context isn't helpful or relevant, far from it. I'm simply advocating that the lessons from God through Paul were not only relevant to the worldview of the spirit gifted hearers of his day, but they are also for us. And that's the evidence that I've put on the screen for this perspective, that it wasn't just Paul writing, it was Paul according to the wisdom given to him, which after all was one of the spirit gifts. And that's the, the pattern which occurs in all of his epistles, not just Corinthians, uh, but all of them. Uh, and they are described as scripture because they are compared to other scriptures. And we know that scripture, that which is scribed, that which is written down, is written for our learning. So that's the pattern uh, that we've got very much in mind as we uh, embark on 1 Corinthians 12 this evening. So what of uh, the first letter to the Corinthians? Uh, so called because um, there is evidence to suggest within the two letters that this actually might be a second letter uh, to, that, that, that the apostle had been caused to write and that two Corinthians might have actually been a fourth. But we're not going to concern ourselves with that now. If that's new to you, perhaps we'll talk about that afterwards. Now this first letter as it's presented here, uh, we realise that the ecclesia in Corinth had a number of problems. Uh, amongst those problems, jealousy and strife that sort of are dealt with in the first four chapters, sexual immorality, brethren filing lawsuits against brethren, disputes over divorce and remarriage, or over marriage and divorce rather, uh, idolatry, um, greed and drunkenness at the Lord's table, false doctrine, particularly about the resurrection from the dead. And there are other problems that are encompassed, but those are perhaps the, the biggest, the ones that stand out uh, most of all. Now, despite all of that, those problems in that list, the first problem to be addressed was the Ecclesia's greatest problem, their distinct lack of unity. So let's come, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. One Corinthians one verse ten. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. 
For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, every one of you, saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptised in the name of Paul? This was the problem. This was the underlying problem, if you like, that linked all their problems. They were not united. They did not have the same mind. They did not have the same care one for the, for the other. There were divisions and strifes. And this theme of uh, a need for unity continues then throughout the epistle. I'll just put up some of the references to it there. The idea of the same thing, mind, judgment, calling, meat and drink, spirit, Lord, God, care. Uh, and, and that of one flesh, one spirit, one God, one Lord Jesus Christ, one bread, one body. They needed to be united because without being united, they weren't going to make any progress in addressing the other problems that beset them at the Ecclesia at Corinth. So this theme then of unity gets picked up in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'd like us to uh, go in at verse 4, please. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. And that word same gets traced through verse 8 and verse 9. Verse 11 But all these worketh that one and the self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. And then what follows, having emphasised this sameness of the spirit gifts, the source of the spirit gifts, and the purpose of the spirit gifts, what follows is the concept of unity developed further through the analogy of a human body. Verse 12. For as... The body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body. So also is Christ, or perhaps it could be rendered, so also is the Christ body. Now I think it's worth exploring this idea of the body of Christ in a little more detail. We're going to come back to 1 Corinthians 12, but I'd like to take you please to Ephesians chapter 1. If you can keep a marker in 1 Corinthians 12, do, because you might like to flick back there in a minute as we read Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1. I want to read a a section here from verse 15 towards the end of the chapter. It's quite long, I know, but it's chosen uh, deliberately. So Ephesians chapter 1, then in verse 15. The Apostle writes through the Spirit, Now to those at Ephesus, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know, What is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that which is to come. Just pause there for a moment. Just look back, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. That extended section from verse 15 to 21 that we've just read sort of is encapsulated by 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 3. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaketh by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. 
The point is, they could work out who truly had the gift by what they said. And they truly knew who the Lord was as the raised Christ, waiting on the right hand of God, far above all principality and power. Because that's what's described here in Ephesians, isn't it? That their eyes, verse 17, verse 18, were opened. That they had been, verse 17, given the spirit of wisdom and the revelation and the knowledge of him. Their eyes, verse 18, were opened uh, and their understanding, uh, they were enlightened. So it's that, that idea, isn't it? That by the spirit they could call Jesus Lord. I think that's what's meant there in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. So describing this elevated position of Christ and the marvellous outworking of God through Christ, Ephesians 1 concludes, verse 22, that God and he, the the inference is God, hath put all things under his feet. That's Jesus. So God hath put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him, Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church or ecclesia and that church or ecclesia verse 23 is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all so God hath put all things under Jesus' feet and has made Jesus the head of the ecclesia and that ecclesia is described here in Ephesians as Christ's body the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? I've not thought of Christ like that before doing this study. The diaglot renders that, which is his body, the full development of him. So, describes the ecclesia as Christ's body, of which Christ is the head, and therefore the body is the full development of him. That filleth all in all. And the emphatic diagram renders the word completeness, which is the body of him, the completeness of him. Now, if I'm right in my understanding there, that's really quite remarkable, isn't it? I think what we're being told is that in some measure, somehow, Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, without the ecclesia, is incomplete. Now I say that very carefully. But I think that's what's being implied here in Ephesians chapter 1. That the body of Christ, over which he is the head, without it, Christ would be in some way incomplete. That it will only be the full development of him once he is united with his body, when he comes again. It's a remarkable thought, isn't it? That somehow we as members of the Ecclesia are required to make up in some way his incompleteness that therefore bestows upon us a very great responsibility because that we need to act united as the body of Christ in order to be the body of Christ to be the full development of him and this idea then of being united as the body as members in particular this should be the driving force in ecclesial life now I hope that was useful, but let's go back with all that in mind to 1 Corinthians 12, please. So having established the importance of unity and appreciated the privilege that is ours to be counted as part of the one body of Christ, we can now look at another aspect that comes out in 1 Corinthians 12, and it's that of diversity or differentness. The point that is now made by God through Paul is that many people constitute that one body. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, that's talking about the natural body, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. It's the same with the body of Christ. How? Verse 13, for by one spirit are we all baptised into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free. What's left out there, by the way? Anybody want to shout out? It's not conventional, but what's left out of that phrase? We normally get three things together, don't we? Whether Jews or Gentiles, bond or free, 
male or female? Not there. It's a question for discussion. Why not? Might it be that they had a particular problem with males and females because the role of the head, you know, the roles of sisters in the ecclesia has already been dealt with in 1 Corinthians and, and the uh, need for the head covering has been emphasised. Maybe they had a particular problem uh, with the roles of men and women and, and, and God thought fit uh, not to emphasise this because that was a difference not worth highlighting at this point to this ecclesia. Food for thought. I, I put it out there. I don't have a better answer for that, but it certainly comes in Galatians, doesn't it? So these are the differences. It doesn't matter. We've all been baptised into the body of Christ, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, bond or free. We've all been made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. That's interesting, that, isn't it? There's two ideas that are running very much in parallel. Both are important. Both, uh, we need both in the Ecclesia. This idea of unity, the idea of oneness, that we can't act unilaterally that what we do will affect other members, will affect ecclesias around us, and that it's not, it's not up for us to do that, to, to upset the balance there. It's what we've got to do there is to work unitedly as the body of Christ, because that's the privileged position we're in. But on the other hand, we aren't all the same. We haven't all come from the same place, as it were. We've got different backgrounds. And so too, the analogy is, is so fitting that, isn't it? Um, we have a great diversity in ecclesial life. Now, with many members comes greater diversity, and this was certainly true of the Corinthian ecclesia. And the history books tell us that Corinth as a city was a very cosmopolitan city. It was very diverse. It was an important seaport. It was a major road junction. It was a garrison town. And it was a strategic, strategic trading centre. So this meant that there was a, a, a great flow of people in and out of Corinth, of all sorts of different backgrounds. And so too that will have been reflected in the ecclesia at Corinth, I am sure. Ecclesial life only ever seems to reflect the society around us. So it should be no surprise to us um, that this analogy then is so appropriate. Now, if we think about it, the human body is made up of lots of different parts and systems, but put them all together in a united form, and we have a living, breathing, vibrant organisation, which is capable of emotion, of movement, of activity. Now, it doesn't matter about our background or culture, our social standing or ethnic origin, the point made here in 1 Corinthians 12 is that we are all the body of Christ. And it has often been remarked, isn't it, if we look around the room even tonight, were it not for the truth, would we have anything to do with most of the people in this room? Probably not. Probably not. We've all got different backgrounds, different ages, different jobs. We may never meet each other in the normal course of events. And yet that drive, that, that truth... This sense of oneness in the body of Christ is such a powerful force that we've all been through the same baptism. We've all experienced the same gift of God, the same privilege, that this force overrides our background, no matter what that might be. And that's certainly the way it should be, and I believe it is, certainly here from what I've seen at rugby. Here in rugby, some are from families who have been in the truth for generations others are not some are very practical others less so some are academically well educated in this world others not so much there are richer there are poorer there are older there are younger there are taller there are shorter the list is endless, isn't it? But what matters is that we've all been baptised into Christ and we are all members of his body. Now, I've laboured that point sufficiently, so let's move on. The chapter continues then uh, to describe what I think I'm going to describe as two ends of a spectrum, both of which are influences which have the potential to disturb the spirit of unity within the ecclesia. Now, I've graphically tried to portray it in a very short space of time this evening, like this. You might have 
a better way of doing it. But let's just bear with this on the screen. Let me work through it and then by all means give me the feedback, uh, hopefully afterwards, but if it's that bad, do interrupt me. Um, so I'm going to suggest that verses 15 to 20 describe those brethren and sisters who at times feel forlorn, abandoned, overlooked. You can perhaps apply other adjectives. But on the other hand, at the other end of the, expectra, the, other end of the spectrum, the other extreme, verses 21 to 25, I think, describe brethren and sisters who sometimes feel very self-sufficient, perhaps very independent, or dare I say it, perhaps at times even superior to others. Now what I'm also going to suggest, that not only does this chapter describe this spectrum, but I'm also going to suggest that we're all on it, somewhere, hopefully, towards the middle. Um, But probably that most of us have a tendency toward one end or the other. Now as I'm one who is known to be shy and retiring, let's begin with the extreme on the left of the screen. So I'm not saying that everybody's in one extreme or the other, but everyone has a tendency one way or the other. Just ask yourself the question, and if you genuinely have no idea what I'm talking about, do tell me afterwards. If you think that you have no recognition of what I describe now, uh, I would be very keen to hear. So 1 Corinthians 12 then, and let's read gone from verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. And to be clear, we're describing, I think now, the chapter's going to describe those who are on the far left of the screen, the shy and the retiring that ends up in the extreme of underconfident, forlorn, abandoned, overlooked. These are my words, by the way, and I make that point very clearly. This is the way I'm trying to understand it. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye... I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? The Greek therefore, is it not, is it therefore not of the body, can also be translated, does it not belong to the body? Just because it doesn't think it's something else, does it still not belong to the body? By inference, well, of course it does. So this extreme then is is characterised by a lack of a sense of belonging. That's what the text seems to be implying here, doesn't it? Just because it's not something else, does it not belong? They feel, these members, whatever they are, feel that they don't belong to the body. They don't have a place in the ecclesia. The question that's asked by the Spirit through Paul is, do you not belong? Were you not baptised into Christ? Are you not of the body? The lack of a sense of belonging. And if this feeling of not belonging is allowed to continue, I think it can develop into, a, into jealousy and an envy of others. The proverb says, The life of the whole body is a tranquil mind, but a decay of the bones is jealousy. That's Rotherham's translations of Proverbs 14, verse 30. The life of the whole body is a tranquil mind, but a decay of the bones is jealousy. Now, chapter 12 continues to describe the folly of this envy of one member toward another. Verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members yet but one body. I think the point here is that in the analogy of a human body, we need all the parts to make it function properly. It's absurd to think of a giant eyeball rolling aimlessly around, unable to do anything else. Or an ear flopped on the floor, that's brilliant at hearing, but can't get itself anywhere and has no other function other than hearing. It is a ridiculous sort of thought, isn't it? But that's sort of how this sense of not belonging, well, you know, we can't all be the same thing. It it doesn't work is the point, isn't it? Now, we can be sure 
in ecclesial life that we do all have a work to do. And whatever our job is, we must do it enthusiastically and the best to the best of our ability. And I think Romans 12 talks about very much the same principle and perhaps gives us more of the solution to the problem. 1 Corinthians 12 describes it very vividly, uh, but how, about, how do we go about remedying the situation? Well, we need to recognise what our task is, what our, uh, our abilities are, uh, and then to do them to the best of our ability. So Romans 12, please, and verse 5. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. <coughs> Just because we don't have the spirit gifts, does not the same principles apply? Do we not have different abilities? Do we not have different things that we can offer in ecclesial life? Let's do them to the best of our ability. So I think the key to overcoming any sense of being withdrawn or despondency is to recognise what our abilities are and to get on and do them cheerfully and enthusiastically. Now there are so many aspects of ecclesial life that we can get involved in here at Rugby. Uh, so many, in fact, that Hannah and I almost feel that we can barely keep up. There's the Sunday School and Ecclesial Party, the Prophecy Day, the Seminars, the Youth Weekend, the Youth Day, the Quarterly Gatherings, the Family Day, and so on. And on top of that, there are the other groups who look after the administration of the Ecclesia, our preaching efforts, our youth groups, so on and so forth. And we can take any single one of those and break it down to find a job for each and every one of us. There are prayers that need to be offered. Advice, experience and mentoring to be sought from those who have done the jobs many times before. They know where the pitfalls are. There are plans to be drawn up. Finances to be thought through. Formulation of talks and printed literature. Advertisements to be distributed in whatever format they are. Venues to be located and booked. Food to be prepared. Rooms to be set out and cleared away again. Lifts to be given. And you could keep going with that list for as long as you liked. But I challenge you, if ever you think you don't have anything you can offer in ecclesial life, then perhaps confide in somebody else that might be able to work out what that is because just because you can't think of what it is in that moment of time that low ebb of your life doesn't mean that it doesn't exist as the scripture said just because you don't think you belong to the body are you not of the body that's the gentle point isn't it that's brought out for those that find themselves if ever they find themselves at that far extreme uh, as I've portrayed it on the left of the screen Sometimes it might help to think about what work we might like to think of ourselves doing in the kingdom. This is something else we can try and do, because it might focus our minds on what we need to work on in this life, which has been described, after all, as a training ground for the kingdom. I've just put five things in a list. There will be a mortal population to teach. Well, you could be involved in the seminars, in preaching efforts, in teaching the young people in Sunday school. There'll be children to instruct and to care for. Choirs to be rehearsed. If you uh, are good at music, I count myself in this, then the singing here at rugby at times could be a little better. (laughs) Let's be honest. A hundred people, it doesn't always sound like there's a hundred people singing. Uh, But that's something we could all work on, isn't there? Uh, And those talented in music perhaps could be encouraged to think about ways we we can try and improve on that. There'll be a temple to be built in the kingdom. There'll be cities to be governed. The thought of governing five cities or ten cities would absolutely frighten the wits out of some of us. And yet others, they'll take it in their stride. It's similar in ecclesial life, brothers and sisters. This is a training ground for the age to come. So what are the other end of the spectrum then, as I've described it on the far right of the, the, stream, the, the screen? What is the extreme of 
those that perhaps are more confident or perhaps more outgoing? Where might they end up if they, if they are not careful? 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 21. Well, verse 20, because it's the connecting verse, isn't it? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Just note the language there in verse 21. The eye looks down on the hand and the head looks down on the feet. I think that's instructive. There's this idea of looking down upon others. You see, whereas those who feel despondent might feel that they have little or nothing to offer in service to the ecclesia and thereby feel that they do not really belong to the body, those who perhaps feel self-sufficient have the opposite problem. The overconfident types tend, if they're not careful, to feel that they have lots they can do and lots they have to offer, and in fact at times they might become a little too involved in ecclesial life. Those who are very capable, multi-talented and outgoing have the potential to give off the perception that others aren't really needed, that they can do the job of ten men. Now, I don't necessarily think this is a conscious thing. I, what People watching is one of my hobbies. Uh, and I have observed this in the past, and I will absolutely give zero names. But I, I've seen it happen, and I, I, I really don't think it was a conscious thing. But people like this can sometimes be so busy in the ecclesia that they brush straight past people, particularly on a Sunday morning, when there's a roast dinner to, to get back to. Uh, and you've got three or four people you've got to speak to before they leave, and you just brush past somebody. Well, you may have brushed past that s- somebody for the last two, three, or four weeks, maybe even months. In fact, when you stop and think about it, it may have been ages since you last spoke to them, asked how they were doing. It's not a deliberate thing, but the effect is very much the same, that that person who's been brushed past so many times before doesn't necessarily feel any more that they belong. They're needed here. If they've got anything they can offer. They'll leave it to the busier types. So we must try and remember that being busy in the truth can only ever be a good thing, but it should never be at the expense of others, the welfare of another brother or sister. The chapter continues, doesn't it? Verse 22. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honourable, upon these we bestow more abundant honour. And our uncomely parts have much more abundant (coughs) comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honour to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Interesting language there, isn't it? It's very much talking through this metaphor of the human body. Uh, And I think the point that's being made is that some parts of the body, of the human body, are always on show. You pretty much always see this ugly mug. My hands are very rarely covered up unless it's very, very cold. But other parts of the body are rarely or never on show. Our private parts are covered with clothing and our internal organs, we hope, never see the light of day. However, the point is, they're all needed in the human body. We might have the sturdiest skeleton, which is bound by the strongest sinews, but we won't get very far without, for example, say, a liver or our kidneys. You won't last very long at all. Because those things filter toxins from the blood. And we could think about how this is outworked. I think this is more challenging to really pin down its counterpart. But one example, if I were thinking through the liver and the kidneys, filtering out toxins, well, how might that apply in ecclesial life? Well, it's often the older and the wiser amongst us that are better at trimming back that very active 
vibrant ecclesial grapevine at times that uh, gets too active and too vibrant and turns into the realms of gossip. And there was a sister at Northampton, now fallen asleep, who would say, do I need to know this? That's all she'd say. Stopped many people in their tracks. By that means, toxins can be filtered from the body. It doesn't take very much, does it? But we can trim gossip. We can challenge the facts that might be being discussed. We can stop the divisions, the strifes, the schisms, the undermining, the pulling down of one another by just a few small words of gentleness, gentle rebuke. So we need to bring our thoughts to a close. What have we learned, or what have we covered this evening? Well, we are so privileged to be part of the body of Christ, with him as our head. Described, I believe, as the full development of Christ, which is quite a remarkable thought, the more I think about that. We must work together to, in all that we do to be united in the way we act. We must try to never let anything divide us. We don't want cliques and divisions. We don't want strifes being stirred up. We must try to do all things for the benefit of each other. We must not look down on others, consciously or subconsciously. We never should give that impression. And we should never envy the work that others do. We all have a job to do in ecclesial life, no matter how big or small, no matter how on show or how behind the scenes. It all needs to be done. And above all, we must not be self-centred, but we need to be sensitive to the needs of one another. Verse 26 or verse 25, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honoured, all the members rejoice with it. Now are ye the body of Christ, and members in particular. That thought in verse 26 is good, isn't it? Still talking about the human body, this is still in the analogy, but how true it is also in ecclesial life. In the natural example, if I've got a sore thumb at the moment, I've told several of you about my thought sore thumb because it's all encompassing at the moment. I knock it, I protect it. In the first thing in the morning, it's stiff. I don't want to have to go and get Joseph out of his cot. It affects everything, the way I am, the way I'm, how grumpy I am, how hunched over I am, how protective I am. It's just my thumb. And yet the whole body reacts with it. You'll do the same if you stub your toe or lift your toenail. It hurts. You withdraw your foot, don't you? You scream or squeal. You look after it. You rub it. It's not just that one member. It has an effect on everything. It's true also of joy, but we get a bit better at hiding it as we get older. Certainly the sort of stiff upper lip, the reserved Brit, uh, is very good at hiding joy. But you can see it best in a, a child that displays joy unreservedly. You know, Joseph, tomorrow we're going to do a little bit of wood collecting and chopping. And he was jumping up and down. He was squealing at the top of his, can I help, can I help? And he's, everything about him is excited. He's red in the face, his heart rates up, his higher pitched voice. It's not just that one aspect, is it? It affects the whole being. You know when somebody is joyful or happy. And you know when they're down, no matter what's bringing them down, the whole body reacts. Well, it should be the same too in ecclesial life. You know, we've seen firsthand the care that you have when one person or one, one couple struggle. We struggled last year. You were brilliant to us. I'm sure, too, that you're good when, when somebody goes through a good thing, whether it's a new job or, uh, or something goes well for them. We see it particularly when somebody uh, falls pregnant, don't you? You see that everyone's happy and, oh, there's another little one in the ecclesia. It's great. And that, there's a buzz and a vibrancy. Well, that's a good thing. And those things need to be developed and nurtured in, in ecclesial life, I suggest. They're a positive thing, because by that we show that we have the same care, one for another. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. I'd like to take you please to Ephesians chapter 4 as our last reference. Ephesians 
Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 10. Ephesians 4 and verse 10. He that descended is the same that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that henceforth that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love.